Um, most people here know Alan Rumsey, Francesca Merlin, who have been working uh, in linguistic anthropology and many related things in Australia and Melanesia for many, many years. And Lauren Reed, uh, a sign linguist, an MA student here. And uh, guests John Onga and his wife Wapi, you're welcome. They've been here for a few weeks all working together. And so now we'll hand over to them. Thanks a lot, and thanks to you all for coming out and for your patience in waiting until Lauren gets multiple things organized at once. Um, this is really her seminar, and so the name, her name first is not, uh, it's not because of alphabetical order. Uh, I'm the facilitator for this project, but I'm really delighted to have Lauren working with us on sign because she knows so much about it and we know so little, and besides that, she's a fantastic field worker. So this project builds on, i sorry, this uh, seminar builds on work that Francesca and I have been doing in other areas besides sign for many years in the uh, Kuwaru area. And uh, on two, two sessions where we actually recorded signs before Lauren got there, she came with us uh, for uh, first field, her first field trip to the Highlands in March and April of this year, and we made a lot more progress with her. But before we get to that, I'm just going to sort of bring you up to where we were as of last year. Um, so this is the Kuwaru region. It's a big dialect continuum with Kuwaru in the middle with multiple, you know, three languages by uh, uh, ethnologue standards, but no real boundaries between them. And this is what the place looks like. Uh, Kalge is a kind of administrative center. It's a school, but it, it's, it's not a, a, a residential cluster in the way that you think of as a village. Some of the people we've been working with for years. John Wapi's young son, who is now about, what, 16, something like that? 15, yeah. <laughs> and there we are, the three of us, working together a few years back. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, and um, I didn't actually, uh, at, although Francesca and I have been working in the area since 1981, we hadn't come across any use of deaf sign until 1997, after somewhat of a long absence. Um, and I, I saw John and this guy too, Galewa, using it, which you'll see a lot more of in the seminar today, so I won't introduce them now. But um, we first recorded, I first recorded the stuff in 2015 with Lewa, whom you saw, but also with these guys, whom you'll see a lot more of today also. Um, so before we get into the material for, uh, for today, the, the substantive material, I just want to give you some background for those of you who want uh, up on much on sign language typology, and <coughs> that wasn't until I met Lauren a couple of years ago. Um, there's the, the, um, how do we, oh, it seems to have stopped advancing on me. <coughs> yeah, the, the most commonly known kinds of sign languages are these so-called deaf community sign languages found in, you know, the sort of national, highly institutionalized ones, uh, at least nowadays, by, like Auslan, ASL, and so forth. And the study of sign language, I think, really shot the prominence in the last few decades, mainly based, first based on the uh, linguist awareness of this stuff and their, I, I suppose, solidarity with those people there. The U.S.C. are insisting on uh, kind of recognition for this stuff as a full-fledged full language and a language of their own. Um, so people, linguists were fascinated by the way in which something uh, in a, seemed at the degree of, uh, of uh, Sophistication of structure, vocabulary, the usual criteria, you know, was on par with spoken languages, was being uh, used by deaf people. But in, um, in other parts of the world, there are much less institutionalized kinds of shared sign languages that are spoken over more or less uh, extensive regions, but mainly within villages, within nucleated villages and clusters of people where uh, there are high rates of deafness, therefore more uh, occasion for multiple deaf people to get together and talk with each other. But I think in most of these so-called village sign languages, they're still used primarily between deaf and hearing people, mm -hmm. which distinguishes them sharply from something like Auslan or all these institutionalized ones, which are all about deaf sociality, and they're used mm -hmm. almost entirely between deaf people and between, you know, a deaf, a deaf, using deaf interpreters. So here's one of the so-called village sign languages of uh, West Africa. They're actually, in their pure form, they're relatively rare. The idea of the village sign language is based on a, a notion that 
if you have concentrations of people that are relatively in marrying, you'll, among other genetic problems, you'll get uh, increased rates of congenital deafness. So that contributes to the, you know, the, the pool of people for whom a sign language is used. Um, but, okay, the other third, the third main type that's known in literature, sort of prominent, is so-called home <coughs> sign systems. These um, are basically uh, focused around one deaf child who, you know, with this tremendous human uh, propensity and drive that we all have to communicate, and the ability to do it, to create means of communicating, innovate means of communicating on a, you know, a fairly, over a fairly rapid time scale, um, and with reaching quite a bit of sophistication when there's a possibility. Um, so I think it's a focus on that sort of process as opposed to the earlier uh, focus on you know, how, shirts, how com uh, community sign languages are like full-blown human languages. The process of generation of these things and the, the way in which it happens uh, over a short time that's more like, it has something in common with our work and the interest in, in it, but of course what we're talking about goes far beyond the stereotype of a science, home sign is a simple system, as you'll see this time. Okay, so just a few, two more points. The home sign, uh, sorry, the village sign idea doesn't work for the New Guinea Highlands, partly because there are no, in this part of it, there are no concentrated settlements where people live. There are no isolated communities. People live spread out across the landscape, interspersed among their garden in mo much more or less open social networks. Uh, uh, a re and so that, was, that makes the village sign stereotype not really applicable. The, whereas the, and the home sign language, on the other hand, these, uh, these systems that we're talking about actually have quite a bit of co in common with that in that, as you'll see, they're mostly based around a single deaf person uh, who has been deaf since childhood and a circle of people around them with whom they communicate. But nonetheless, there, are, uh, there is a core of widely shared signs across the the New Guinea Highlands. The only other study that's ever been done of a deaf sign language, or published anyways, by Adam Kendon in, the in 1980, working right about here with the Maya Inga. And from his material, we can find lots of common signs that are shared amongst people in this area. Uh, current work going on in Chimbu province in Sina Sina um, by Samantha Rarick, and we know from her material as of 2017 that there are some shared signs within our area. Um, so the question is, how are we to regard this? Is, is there a, a single language with you know, dialects across the area or multiple languages that are springing up on the basis of a few common shared elements? So uh, that's the question we went to try to get further on in 2018. And here's to tell you what we found while well, I said the speaker. <laughs> well, thanks, everyone. So I'm just going to It's really more stable if you put it horizontally. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so thanks everyone. So as, um, as Alan mentioned, we went to Kyle which is right here, in 2018 for a month's worth of science and civic field work. This is a bit grainy, but you can see, this is Mount Hagen, the capital of Western Highlands province up here. It's about 50,000 people live there, and that's fairly dense, uh, a fairly dense urban area. You travel uh, on a public motor vehicle, a public bus, um, about an hour, hour and a half, um, up here to Kyle which as, as Alan mentioned, is not really it's, it's hard to describe. It's not a village, it's, it's, and it's not even really a community. People are sort of, uh, if you were in Hagen, you'd say, I come from Kalge. But if you were in Kalge, you'd say, I come from Taomong Puna, which is John's place, just up here north from the Sing Sing ground. And Kagul, um, one of the deaf people with whom we worked, he would say, I come from, if he was in Kalge, he would describe himself as coming from Ugrugu. So, um, Again, so Kalge is tucked up here at the base of this tumble range, which you can't see that well. Indeed, the name of the local speech variety is Kuaru, which means um, steep cliffs. Steep stone or cliff. S yeah. Steep stone or cliff. Yeah. Um, uh, so the two people with whom um, Alan and Francesca had worked in the past are Kagul and Lewa. We knew that there were a lot of other deaf people in the area, so we went there and used a snowball sampling method to find other deaf people around. That is, we asked, I thought we would ask deaf people, what other deaf people do you know? What I was surprised to find is that there's so little deaf sociality there, deaf people don't know each other that well, but they often didn't really know. You might look at this and see, oh, there's three deaf people there and there's three here, they must form little sign communities. They really don't. People 
there, there are other levels of identity that are much more meaningful for the deaf people in this region, like tribe, rather than deafness. Um, uh, 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 yes. And this is in stark contrast to, um, say, in Australia, in the Auslan, Australian Sign Language Signing Community, which is one of the first things you do when you meet is work out who you are, who's your family, and try and situate each other among at least the Australian seaboard, you know, of, of um, uh, resident Auslan speakers. That's just not really the case here. We did snowball sample very successfully, but we didn't need to use deaf people as our um, referrers. We could use hearing people. This woman, Daphne, she lives up in Hagen now, but she's actually from her mother's from up near Kogul's place, and her um, father's over here in um, Tamil. So she grew up most of her life here, although she's spread up um, there in, uh, she's living in Hagen at the moment. Um, um, yes. And I just wanted to point out, this is seven, a seven kilometre scale. So it's a fairly small area. It's maybe about 10 kilometres wide, divided by this um, tum part of the Tumble Range, which are fairly high mountains, and about, um, you know, four or so kilometres uh, tall. I'm going to give Martin this chair because it's very important for him to see the <laughs> He's our public relations media guy. <laughs> <laughs> There's a space over here. Yeah. Well, be that might be a bit tricky. Yeah, yeah, it might be a bit hard to get it over there. So, in addition to the, so all the people in white with their names are the people with whom we worked. These pink icons are people that we, deaf people that we found out about, they had either died very recently before um, we arrived there, or we heard about them too late to work with them. So these are some more leads for us to go back and work with um, on, a, on a further field trip. Um, here I've got a couple of pictures of deaf people with whom we worked. So what did we find out? So we find out that um, Communicating by deaf people and communicating with deaf people draws on a whole communicative ecology shared across the region, which includes sign, gesture, including um, majority hearing community and romantic gesture, mouthing, speech, vocalisation, and pointing, both absolute directional pointing and deictic pointing. So deaf people draw on this whole communicative ecology, the ecology that they live in, according to the strengths of their interlocutor, whether that interlocutor is deaf or hearing. Um, each, as Alan mentioned, each deaf person is at the centre of a, of a communicative network. Around will be clustered um, uh, regular interlocutors and then fanning out from that more peripheral interlocutors that they might see more sporadically. These networks are really diverse in what resources they prefer out of that whole communicative ecology. Some communicative networks are much more speech dominant rather than sign dominant. They're also very diverse in how elaborate they are. Um, but at the same time, there's, as I mentioned, there's a sameness to all of these networks in that they have this core of common, what we're calling common signs that almost all of them draw on, although sometimes these common signs will be manipulated and kind of develop their own like ideolectoral variation within a sign network. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, we're going to show you one example of one sign network, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about... Um, common signs and actually I wanted to say not only do does each network draw on the common signs that are available they also draw on the language ideologies of not all but many hearing people in the area that it's both easy and and necessary and not particularly stressful to talk to deaf people and that's the other part of our talk that we're going to talk about today how um, this common sign and also language ideology works in the mind of a great hearing signer which is John and we will get into John's part short soon. All right, so first of all, our case study um, and of the assigned network that we'd like to um, show you today, this is Kagul Kuglu. He is uh, the only deaf man at Kyoge. Um, I'll explain more about where he actually lives in relation to that, to that downtown Sing Sing ground that's sort of called Kyoge. He's married to Mona. They have five children. Kagul has lived his whole life at, in the Kyoge area. Uh, he has uh, two brothers. Um, he has a number of siblings, but he has two brothers with whom he's close and also four childhood friends with whom he's close, all of whom, um, uh, two childhood friends have only recently moved away in the last year or so, but uh, for essentially his whole life, and he's about 45, 50, they've all been living in the area, um, interacting pretty much daily. So what is 
this language like? Now, this is a clip of Kabul and his very good childhood friend, Simon. We have <coughs> overdubbed the signing with a voiceover rather than subtitles <coughs> so that you can focus on the signing and just watch how fast and effortless and sophisticated the interaction is. Oh, and yes, I should say, I'm sorry that this film does contain reference to community violence, violence against men, violence against women. It also um, talks about court, so people in the area, when, they, um, when problems happen to settle disputes, everyone goes to like village court and negotiates compensation, which is normally paid in pigs or money, you know, according to the, 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 the damage done to the people involved. You know the fat guy, clean shaven with the Land Cruiser, lives up that way? Yeah, he lives up there, yeah, yeah. So his sister who's married down that way, how she got beaten up, do you know about that? Not really, she got beaten up, I think. Yeah, she got beaten up, they all went to court about it. Yeah, I know about the court. What was it about, though, over land, or...? Okay, so you know how she was married before? Yeah. Okay, so she left her two kids and went back to the first guy, stayed for two days, and then uh -huh, came back. Uh-huh. She stayed for two days. She went back to that druggie, left her kids behind. Yeah, she went off. Stayed up there and yeah, came, came back. back. So you know that guy who lifts and smokes weed? Yeah, yeah. He beat her up. Uh-huh. So he went down to Kyle Gay. And you know that guy, the Catholic guy who sells beetle nut? Uh-huh. Yeah. The two of them came down and beat her up. Yeah, and punched her in the face. You heard yeah, about that? Yeah, I did hear about that. So now they're all holding court about that. Really? You know about that? Yeah, yeah, so I was down there at Kyrgyz a few days ago, hmm, on Wednesday. I saw it all going on then. Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. Uh, no, hang on, it was Monday. That's right, Monday when I saw it all. Last week? Day. So today's Sunday. Yes, last, last Sunday. week. Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So last Sunday you saw them all going out and all that stuff with John's yeah, son. Yeah, John's son down at Kanye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the principal's nephew was like, you put more in. Like, no, if you think there should be more money, you put some in. Back and forth, back and forth. That guy with the weird nose, his son, John's son, the rice seller, he punched him in the nose. Punched him in the nose. That's right. They hit his teeth. Yeah, right? hit his teeth. One wobbled, but it stayed, didn't fall out. <laughs> So you can see the turns are so fast, it's so precise, they're even overlapping. It really, and this language is, although it does draw on those resources, this, it is one generation old. This is, we have not, not none of the other networks we worked with have this level of complexity and elaboration. As far as we know. As far as we know, <laughs> yeah. that's right. Uh, or this is Kabul. Which is the deaf guy, okay. you can't tell. <laughs> well, it's true, you can't tell who the deaf guy is because they're so good. So Kagul is the deaf guy, he's on the left, and then Simon is his long-term hearing, long-term childhood friend, daily interlocutor on the right. So I think it's important to explain how we actually gloss that. So what I, I didn't start off doing this, but I eventually started to rely on this wholly because it worked so incredibly well. At first I would be in the room with um, the signers, but they would slow down for my benefit. And I started to notice this, that this was happening. So uh, I started to record them. That was actually the first time I ever did that. Kabul had been up at my place, and then Opus ran up and had been at the court. So Opus knew something that Kabul did not know. And he started to tell Kabul, I said, stop, get in the, let's go in the room, and I'll put the camera on, and I'll go out and you tell the story. Which is then what I started doing, recording people, telling, having conversations, telling stories with me out of the room. Then we'd go in, I'd take the chip out of the video camera, put it in the laptop, and then rather than sitting there and trying to annotate it in a land on the fly, which would take a really long time and everyone would get horribly bored, I would record the glossing process, which created all this great like rephrasing and he said it like that and well you should have said it like this and also metalinguistic commentary on um, on the language. Mm -hmm. Alright, now this is relevant to the next video that I'm going to show you. So this is remember I said this is zoomed in. Remember I said this is Kyle Gay. So this is um, Kabul's uh, traditional lands. So every, um, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, every place in the Highlands has a tribe associated that they own that place. In this part of the Highlands. In this part of the Highlands. So Kalga is the Kogia tribe place. Within Kogia tribe you've got um, various clans. 
and each clan has their own place within that tribal land. So Kagul, his clan is Nopeng. Nopeng literally means headwater. The Nopeng place is up here at the headwaters of this river, the Ugugu River. It's about, it'll be, it's about 30 minutes for Kagul to get from there to there. For me to get up there, it's about 90 minutes. <laughs> um, to get up there, you have to cross two rivers, which are over these, um, it's just a, si this one is a single log with this tiny little bit of wire that you're supposed to use to just guide yourself gently across. This one has no wire. These um, uh, vines and rope handholds were put up by Kagul to the very end of the trip. Um, I'd been trying to organise it the whole time I was there. At the very end of the trip, I managed to go up and stay with his family for two nights. So Kagul put up all these rope branch things <laughs> for the 10 seconds it took me to walk across, <laughs> you know, like two days' worth of work. Anyway, but that's, the relevant, that's relevant to this next conversation between... So this is Kagul, his wife, Mona, who is hearing, and um, four of Kagul's five children, all of whom are hearing. This is also overdubbed. So, you know, the white woman is going to go, and then after a bit, she's going to come back. This house won't do. We could move and build over there or over there. What do you think? You know the family with the blind girl? The, the blind girl. Yeah. They build on their land. The who? The guy with the no, funny eye. The guy eye. who smokes dope. <laughs> Over there, near his sweet potato garden. Uh, uh huh, uh huh. If the white woman comes back, like, the river is so high, I know. we should build over there. Ah, mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that pig house is still not done. Damn, I need to cut some posts for it. Then it'll be pig house? The one there. Our one? Uh huh. Finish the pig house first, and then when that's done, you ask the white woman, would you prefer us to be living down there? Uh -huh, Did uh -huh. you ask her When already? the white woman comes back, I'll ask her. Would you like to stay up here or down there? No, not here. Trudging up here, it's a hassle. Building over there, it's just an easy walk. One river, that's the spot. Having to come all the way past there up to here, no. <laughs> I don't mind where they live. I think Muna's just like, I've got a, I've got an argument now. <laughs> All right. So um, now on the house sign thing. Hang on. Oh, I think my slides are slightly out of order. Anyway. Oh no, if they're not, don't worry. All good. So in order to get, in order to have this degree of fluency. Um, it is unsurprising that there is grammatical complexity even in this very young language, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples of it. So this sign that we're going to look at, it's got two components. It's got a manual component, like this, and it's got an, uh, a, an, an oral component. <laughs> so see the sign? comes at the end of both of those clauses.
This is one theory on, of language evolution. If you take the view that a human language was originally gestural, then vocal noises began to accompany the gestures, then the gestures dropped away, and that's how we got spoken language. This, this, there are a number of signs that have an oral component, and sometimes the manual component gets dropped, and the signers only do the oral component. Here's another example of grammatical complexity. And this um, shows, it has to do with numbers, and it shows how, so the counting that we're going to show you, this is not a deaf thing, this is, uh, this is how people, like how in uh, white Australian society you count one, two, three, four, five, and so on. This is how the um, way that everyone counts in Western Highlands is harnessed and modified to create a different meaning in the sign language. So the fingers go in as you count instead of going out. Yes. Like wrapped up. Yeah, so it's focused on the palm, f folding in. Mm -hmm. Total is ten. At the, the total is ten. And mm -hmm. you can repeat that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or if and if uh, you'll see soon, twelve is ten and two. All right. So the the last salient finger in a number hand shape, so in <coughs> I keep wanting to say that's eight, but it's that's ten. That's, eight. So eight. that's ten. That's ten, yeah. Yeah. So that's nine. So eight, nine, ten. Nine, the last finger you moved down was, or the, you, the finger that's meaningful is this sticking up thumb to say nine. So when that's flicked out in the sign language here at Kyogo, that means approximately that number. Approximately 12. <laughs> One month, two months, three months, four months, five months, six months, seven months, eight months, nine months. That was the end of the year. That was it. Well, that was that sound again. Then I came back in January. Remember this from the previous video. 
This is very subtle. <coughs> yeah, that's fine. You can turn the lights out. I think you can see. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate it for you because it's very fast and it's very subtle. But we spent a long time looking at this and glossing it. So that's child. So, and this is one, two, three, so on. So this is the, the, like the one finger, and that's the two finger. And sometimes people only use the finger, like before when you saw Kagel saying Wednesday, he just used that number three finger for the third day. So he, uh, Simon says one, and then he moves, he changes his finger to the two hand shape as he's articulating the sign for child, which should classically be like this. So he says two children. Uh. One and then a bigger one as he raises his hand. One, two. And this is a, a bigger child. Yes, exactly. Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I guess, yeah, it's inflected for. Um, I'd have to think about what that would mean. But exactly, there's more. So there are really in three there. components there number, mm -hmm. inflected as a child, and the relative age. It, yes, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, that's it. So this is an example of um, how the sign community uh, kind of reduce the articulatory space and therefore m sort of move away from the classic iconicity um, that um, all sign languages are characterized by iconicity uh, but you can see how the sign here comes away from the very iconic like citation form house which is how like Kagel would have always signed house to me then they they're doing this sign in this um, in this clip and you'll see a bit of how I lost it and how they modify their signing when they're signing amongst the really good signers in the network. So they just do this little kind of knuckle tap rather than bringing the hands up to do the citation form house. House. Oh, house. Yes. Like click, click off. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Click, click accent. Yes. Mm. For fast one. Mm -hmm, that's right. <laughs> this la uh, house. Yes, mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, along with you me, yeah. some shortcut. Um, shortcut. Yeah, good job. Yes. No, okay. So how does this happen again in one generation? So it. Well, I, we think it happens because Kagel has this exists, this is his sign network. So he's at the center, he's got his two brothers. Um, Sap, uh, sorry, Seth has now died, but every impression I get is that they were like absolutely joined at the hip. And then Simon, Nick and D, Thomas and Wynn are his close, these guys form this little like boy gang and they did everything together all the time. These guys have just recently moved away, um, but only in the last year or so. His parents that who have died, but I have heard were very good signers. His wife is a very good signer, and his five children who are all um, learning the sign language. Now within that, they're the they're the ones that are so good that you can't tell who's deaf and who's hearing. Mm -hmm. Within that, the Nopeng clan up at Ugugu are all decent signers. Like they can they can have a good <coughs> conversation. So this network exists within <coughs> this wider, that's the, that peripheral, then the whole Kolpia tribe at Kage, because Kagel spends a lot of time down at Kage, remember he has a house down near the downtown, and many Kolpia, not all, but many Kolpia, including John, are good, um, are good signers and good, they know uh, Kagel's idiosyncratic signs that characterise his language. So now I would like to introduce John Unger. And do you, are you happy sitting, or you want to stand up? Come. So, John, do you want to introduce yourself? You yes. stand here, and I'll come and sit down. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Yeah. My name is uh, John Onga, and I come from Papua New Guinea. And uh, uh, my province is Western Islands. Some of you know, but uh, I think the other side just know. And uh, small, uh, my village is Kanjige which is in the Tambor Nebula district, a district called Tambor Nebula. <coughs> and uh, I, I, when I was uh, 15 years old, 
I met my friend here, we never call our names, but we call food name, which is mint and... Lean pig meat. Pig meat. <laughs> and, uh, uh, friend, uh, Apple, I never call her name, but... Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I was a the real name. Uh, the young man. Uh, they were there in 1981. I worked with them in this, uh, I think, uh, language research. So till now, I came here. And then uh, last uh, this year, these guys went to my place and uh, they were looking for, you know, sign language people. So from, from there, uh, I, I have two friends, two sign language. Uh, and I, before I go on, uh, uh, that is, uh, she is my wife, and then his wife is. So, I'm uh, 53 years old. Now, this is my 53. Yeah. And uh, I have two uh, sign language people in our place. One is uh, Lewa and one is Kakul, uh, which uh, we already have seen in photographs. So, uh, I, I'm very happy to work with uh, white people. But I know, you know our sign language, some of you know, but uh, some of you, I think you don't know our sign language because even with me too, when you do sign language in your, I think, where I will, I think, I don't know. I will don't understand what you, but, but some, uh, I think, I finished, uh, I did not much, but I only uh, did grade six, grade six in my uh, primary school. So I can speak language, English. Sometimes I will go cranky, so don't mind about it. So uh, this is my history. And uh, I have two uh, friends, which uh, uh, I have two sign language. This is my best friend. His name is Lewa. And we live together in my place, but in Kalge, but a separate place. Therefore, his own la uh, land, which is Kumbu. And this is my enemy. Uh, we fought in uh, 19, uh, uh, 2005. <laughs> Tribal enemy. Tribal war. Mm. But now we live peacefully in our place. John, tell me, tell everyone how you met um, Kumsa Lewa. Okay. <laughs> this fellow, one time, uh, is uh, uh, in I have to make sign language to show that you people can know. Mm. So it's a sign language. So when I went to town and I saw him sitting on a, a concrete. Then I went close to him and asked him, I do like this, why are you sitting down here? Then I said, he said, I come with my counselor and he left me here and he went away. So then from there, I gave him 50 kina, which is like this. This is 50 kina, you know. Smarty said, Michael Smarty, now Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. That he said it's on a 50 in a note so. Uh, <laughs> That's a, why I sleep like this. He has like a beard, doesn't yes, he? Yes, he usually sleep like this. Mm. And that's 50 in a note. I gave it to him and I said, you hungry? So you go and buy some food. And he went to the store and he buy some food. Then we went home. From that time, we were best friends. <laughs> I made it. But in the past, I saw him, but we didn't. I didn't talk to him. In 1970, uh, 97, I mean. 1997. 1997, mm. I met him. Very good. So that's it. Let's now. No, no, stay here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so remember in the beginning of the presentation, we were talking about these common signs that are widespread across the area. This is an example of one of those signs. It's the sign of the child. And this is a... This occurs in networks that are even um, unconnected, as in the deaf people within them don't know each other. Kangambuga, child.
So you've all got the sign, child. But uh, Kumsilewa has his own version of child. As I said, sometimes sign networks, they take these common signs and they have their own idiorectal variation. So we're going to show you first Kumsilewa, how he signs child. John, I'm going to show everyone you talking with Kumsalewa and then you talking with other deaf people that you came and worked with us with. And do they have children? You ask Kumsalewa. So John, tell us, how did you know that those ladies would understand this sign, child? Because that is our common uh, sign language with uh, other, uh, you know, deaf people, but only Leo and me, that's our special one. Mm. So when, to when we're talking about the kids, we still do like this. Mm. That's only Leo and, Leo and me, not other comrades. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So you don't use it here talking to these ones? Mm -hmm. You don't use the lip? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. All right. Now let's have a look. Uh, John, can you tell us about our trip to Winjaga and meeting Kumsilwali? You can stand up. Okay. <coughs> so here's this one. Uh, this red one is. This Gaige. one is Kaige, uh, which is my place. Uh, we were here, mm -hmm. and we had uh, people saying that there are three uh, dead people up at uh, Tambul, which is Long uh, That lady's place, what is place. So. Uh, when that time, Minch and Apple, Lauren, they were there in my place in this year. So we woke up, uh, not woke up, but we went up there and uh, and to meet uh, Kumsin Wali in that place here, which is behind this mountain, this place. Kaige is here, uh, here and uh, Winsaka is somewhere near. Yeah. So yeah. See, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think. So you, normally you guys used to walk over the mountain, yes. right? Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> we used to take walks up, but now these days it's a, it's raining a lot and the landslide, and we can't walk mm -hmm. across. So we used to take road uh, road transport to go to Winsag and all these places. Mm -hmm. Now tell us about um, Wally. Is she married? Yeah, uh, Wally uh, got married. Uh, she got married, but her first husband died and left with uh, four kids. And he died, and then she got married to another uh, man, and now she she's living with that man, and has one uh, boy child. Great. All right, come and have a seat. I'm going to play you meeting um, Komsilwali. So again, John had never met um, Wali before. I should say this Komsil Komsil is the word for deaf. It literally means ear giver, which is doesn't really make sense compositionally. People are known in this part of, in this rural area, if they're deaf, they're known as kumsilewa, kumsilwali, kumsilwali. It's not pejorative at all, it's just a word. Okay. So this is the first conversation John had with both of these women in the next valley. 
and he's provided the voiceover, and as has Wapi. <coughs> I heard about your husband who died. So I'm very sorry. Your husband now is okay? Does he give you money? Does he work? No. And the pigs? I do it. Does he break fire for you? I do it. And do you? <laughs> okay. Now, let's watch the signs that John uses in that interaction. So John, tell us, John Stenner, tell us how you, what signs you use with her. <coughs> like God oh, work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> when, uh, when we talk about uh, men, we still do like this. Mm. <laughs> men and women, <laughs> like this. Mm. And uh, fire, fire. Mm. and firewood. Mm -hmm. Gardening. Mm -hmm. And sweet potato? And, uh, uh, sweet potato. <laughs> Banana. <laughs> sugar and cane? sugar cake. <laughs> this way. And, and the building house. Mm -hmm. This way. Mm -hmm. House. And small kids, you already know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you knew uh, that you could do uh, uh, white, yeah, white. white people. Straight here. Because we have Straight smooth, and, uh, smooth hair. <laughs> cars. <laughs> and uh, aeroplane. <laughs> Pig. 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 Why would that be? We usually, we usually tie the pigs li live most of their life in the daytime tethered. Uh, yes. About the that's to why to the yeah. uh, their people will know it. Check it, this is big. Money? Money? This is one kina. Two kina. Fifty kina. Twenty kina. And then the hundred kina? <laughs> it has an airplane on the So even though you never met these ladies before, you could talk to them? Yes, because I know they will still uh, know what we, I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Because this is our usual uh, sign language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, Kat, what about the people at Winjaga that we met? Could they do action? Did they do action with I the think no, there? because uh, they uh, don't go close to uh, these uh, two women because they thought that they are deaf. So they never go to the house and, you know, make sign language to to, with them, so that's why they no, don't know, mm, mm. I think. The culture at Winjaga is yes. different. People don't sign as much at Kage. Mm. And women, these women, they were born, they were not born in Winjaga, were they? Yes. They were got married at Winjaga. Yeah, married in. They married in. They married yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. Usual yeah. pattern. That's right. Okay, have a seat, John. Thank you. So um, now I'm going to show you those three common <coughs> signs that John used for man, garden work, and um, pig. And these are a whole, some of the 12 deaf people that we worked with you, uh, doing these three signs, and you'll see that they're um, all the same. Is the is the stove still on? No. 
Okay, so. <clears throat> Alright, and then as Alan mentioned at the beginning, we've had the um, opportunity um, now to compare the, the common signs that continually recur across the synapses of the deaf people we work with, with Adam Kerner's work in 1974 um, in the neighbouring Enga province. And there are uh, a number of shared signs, including these ones. So the question the negator, man and woman. There are more, but um, uh, these are the only ones for which he had line drawings that were the same as ours. You can see how the woman here is is different to woman all across the sign networks we work with. Women always have something to do with the breast, but some people do like this, some people like that. So this is an example of how the common signs get modified um, among sign networks, but the concept's the same. We've also been able to compare our work with um, work by Samantha Rarick, as Alan mentioned, in neighbouring Chimbu province. And again, lots and lots of commonality. Even though there's no deaf people moving between these networks and you know, cross-pollinating these signs. Um, so what does all of this mean for sign typology? Bringing it back to Alan's um, discussion at the beginning about different sign types. So uh, is Kuggles elaborate sign network, can we characterise that as home sign? I mean, in some ways it fits because it's, uh, it's a network that is around one sole deaf person. But um, what I would argue for is a reformulation of this idea of home sign. In sign linguistics, it's, it's almost a pejorative term. And indeed, an abstract that we submitted recently, it was accepted, thankfully, but they wrote back, uh, in your talk, you're going to have to prove that this is not home sign as if that's like some, as if that's a, a bad thing. Mm -hmm. The idea of home doesn't work here, this nucleated home, um, very Western idea. Uh, the other thing is most, the classic home sign model is uh, one deaf child, a, a community sign language exists out there in the community, but the parents are trying to raise their deaf child um, using an oral method and trying to teach them to lip read, speak, use an implant or so on, it's not working. So then the child's trying valiantly to communicate and the parents usually don't participate in the system. There is no community sign la language to access up here. So people really want to talk to their deaf kids um, and that is means that all interlocutors are actively participating in this, um, in this system. Uh, so this work is similar to, some of you might have seen John Haviland's work in Zinacantec, uh, it's in a country, mm -hmm. yeah, in Mexico, um, yeah. where we had a seminar here last year. Yeah, mm -hmm. so he did a. Uh, he's working with a family who have three deaf siblings, one hearing sibling in the same age generation, and then one of the deaf siblings has one child, and they form again <coughs> this really tight little network, which is s extremely sophisticated and very very subtle, and does all this work with gaze. Um, and I think that this kind of language, Kuggles language, really shows like what it is to be human, that root of human sociality of like trying to communicate and how rapidly language can um, crystallise and become sophisticated in such a short period of time. So, and then secondly, there's no established theoretical formulation in sign linguistics to explain uh, this, uh, all these common signs that are spread across this really wide area. Um, this is a situation that is starting to be reported now in lots of socio-demographically roughly similar situations like in Mali, Nepal, other parts of Mexico, Chitino, Mexico. 
So those deaf community sign languages, ASL, Auslan, British Sign Language, they're thought of as like the prototypical sign language. And most sign linguistics is based on those sign languages. But those sign languages, even the oldest of them, is only a few hundred years old. They really, they really only come into being once deaf people start to uh, usually go into residential schools and then you start to get lots and lots of deaf sociality and deaf people intermarrying and, um, and this, this community sign language happens. Arguably, this type of communicative ecology around deaf people, um, by and around deaf people, is vastly older and is vastly more prevalent in the world as the most common type of signed communication. So the next step, so I'm leaving on Monday to go and work for a month in Moresby on a different, totally different sign language in Papua New Guinea called PNGSL, Papua New Guinea Sign Language. Papua New Guinea Sign Language is, is a very new urban deaf community sign language. It's grown out of an imported sign system from Australia, but is rapidly um, becoming its own thing. Deaf people in Moresby and also in Madangle, other big urban cities, are starting to intermarry for the first time. Um, they're forming communities around, um, particularly in Moresby, around um, a particular Seventh-day Adventist church. They're becoming very vocal and very active, advocating for um, better interpreting and deaf jobs and so on. Um, the interesting thing about capturing this moment is that all PNGSL signers are not native. They are all, this is the first generation of PNGSL signers. Um, they are all, their native sign language is a local sign language similar to the one that we've been looking at for this seminar. So I'm really interested in A, looking at the variation in PNGSL before it, a dictionary is in the stages of being produced and I know that when that happens, I can already see it happening from work we did with the PNGSL signer up in Hagen, it will become very, very prescriptive and a lot of that variation will get um, pushed out once the dictionary is produced. And also I'm interested in looking at their attitudes towards uh, their own local sign languages and um, now this new urban deaf community sign language. We'd really like to go back to the Highlands and work further with the people with whom we worked. That method of recording people um, having a conversation with me out of the room it, I tried it with other people, it did not work unless you had a really long established, if you had a lot of trust build up, otherwise people just really did not understand what was going on. And indeed you really, most of like this recording, this, she, um, this is Rachel, she's deaf, her parents are really active in trying to communicate with her and I've got some really, uh, like an interview with them about like, well what else are we gonna do? Like of course we're gonna talk to her, she's our daughter. Mm -hmm. She's the oldest of about seven kids all the other kids are hearing, and apparently they all were really good signers. But this was filmed in a home, like a little uh, dorm room at a Lutheran guest house. So it's not very conducive to being like relaxed and natural. So to go back and work with people in their homes and would see them in their network and in their environment, we'd also really love to do more work with Kugel and his family. His five kids are good signers and are acquiring the language and it's very interesting to watch it happen. We're giving a presentation at ALS which will be in part about that, the emergent normativity within the family about how to sign, what's good signing and what's bad signing. And they are our thank yous. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>